soon will be I'll be recording this lecture for public uh, for public consumption. Yes, you can. Uh, yes, you can see the feedback for the set. But hindi namin uh, hindi namin makita. We won't see who uh, who submitted the feedback. So it's anonymized. Okay. So yeah. But still, it depends uh, on the faculty member if uh, he or she will act on the feedbacks. Okay. All right. So great. So for today, we're going to. Uh, continue our uh, discussion okay, on uh, uh, persistence file systems. Okay? So I'm not sure if this will be the last lecture, but I think this will be the last lecture for COMSI 125, I think. Okay? So I hope you uh, learned something from this course. And probably our next meeting will be the exam, or which will be scheduled on the finals week. All right, so let's start. Okay. So for today, we're going to talk about file system implementation. Uh, last time we talked about the file system API. We discussed the different system calls that are that can be used by programmers or developers to access file system related operations or to perform file system related operations like opening a file, reading a file, creating a file, deleting a file. So today we're going to focus on how these system calls are probably implemented in the context of the, of the file system. So uh, in the, our textbook, we have a, a description or a simple, uh, very simple file system that will, be, that will probably be the context of the discussion, the lecture. And it was also mentioned in uh, a step that in order to understand about file systems, we need to look at two key elements. The first one is the on-disk data structure, which basically describes how the data or the meta metadata are organized on the file system. So, so what, what we mean here is that uh, the file system is basically just an abstraction, similar to the way we look at a virtual memory, right? So in the context of virtual memory, we have the memory as seen by the programmer, that is the virtual memory, and we actually have the physical memory. Right? Similar to file system, we have the disk, which is the actual storage of data, and then the file system will just be an abstraction right, on how uh, these data are actually stored on the disk. So in order to understand, to learn about how file systems are implemented, we, we try to look at the data structures that are being used by a specific, uh, a particular uh, file system implementation. So we know that we have different types of file systems. We have ext2, ext3, ext4. We have NTFS, we have FAT, VFAT. So each of these file systems will have their own different data structures to represent data and metadata on the disk. So that's how we're going to look at. The second aspect uh, of, uh, uh, or way to think about file system is to look at the access methods. How does uh, this particular file system perform a read, perform a write, perform a delete, right? So these two aspects, the data structures and access methods will allow us to somehow characterize the operation of a file system. So this will allow us to differentiate different types of file systems. Now let's start with the first uh, abstraction. Right? So Let's call uh, the first abstraction is called a block or a disk block. Right? So a block is the basic division in disk and typically 4 KB. Now, if we're going to compare this to the virtual memory, what do you think is the equivalent of block, especially in paging? Okay. So you can see that there, the counterpart of blocks in disk will be page. Right? So great. So you will notice that the size of the page, which is 4 KB, is usually also the size of a page, which is 4 KB also. So later on, you will see that there is a relationship between a page and a disk block, right? So now let's look, uh, so we have the block. So now let's look at a disk partition. What do we mean by a disk partition? So we have, we, you, let's say you bought a physical disk, say two terabyte SSD, or not, not necessarily SSD, uh, two terabyte uh, Seagate disk, right? So what will happen is that this disk can actually partition, can be partitioned 
so that each partition can be organized as an array of blocks. Okay? If you're using a dual boot system, for example, you have one partition that is being used by Windows and another partition that's being used by Linux. So you have a single disk, but these two disks uh, uh, or, uh, this disk was or, uh, is partitioned into two partitions, one NTFS used by uh, Windows and another one EXT4 used by Linux. Okay. So each of these two partitions will have different layouts depending on the file system. Now, in the case of Linux, uh, we can uh, abstract it this way. So a disk partition is nothing more than an array of blocks. So you, this example, which is illustrated in the VSFS, the idea here is that this particular partition has 60, 64 blocks, right? 64 blocks. So take note that each block here represents, represents four kilobytes of data. So zero to 63. And each square here, each block is uh, uh, four KB, right? So that is essentially a disk partition. It's an array of, of blocks, right? Now, in the VKFS, uh, as described in our textbook, right, this is how the this partition is laid out, right, or the mapping or the description of the different parts of the uh, this partition. So as you can see here, we have the data region. Right? What is this data region? So it's basically just the set of blocks that will be used for storing the actual data. If you have a file, uh, if your file is stored, uh, they will be stored in this data region, right? And then we also have the inode region. So what is this inode, uh, re inode region? Now the inode region contains the metadata, right? So normally you can see that the data region is quite a lot here. And then you have the inode region, which is just a few, a few blocks here. So as you can see here, one, two, three, four, five. Five blocks are used for the uh, inode region. So recall that an inode is an inode is an internal representation of a file. So essentially, the uh, the data, right? The data associated with a file. So you have an inode, and that is stored. That usually you have an inode number. In addition to the human readable name, you have an inode number. So. So this is an example of an inode, and usually the size of an inode that describes a file is 128 bytes or 256 bytes. Now, now recall that each square here represents 4 KB. So how many, how many, you'll see later how many inodes can fit in a single block. Basically, just divide that. Okay. And then we also have the data bitmap, which, uh, which describes which data blocks are used or unused. So bitmap is a data structure, right? It's basically uh, uh, an array of bits, okay? And then you can just uh, perform bitwise operation, ones or zeros. One, if, if a particular block is uh, occupied, zero if it is not occupied. So for example, uh, a particular value in that bitmap is set to one, then that block is used, right? Now there are two types of bitmaps. We have the data bitmap, which is used to determine which block in the data region are available or not. And then also have the inode bitmap, which uh, describes which inodes here can be, can be used, okay? So, and then lastly, we have the super block. So the super block is, it contains the information about the specific file system. So it, it is different for each file system. So each partition will have a super block. So a super block for ext 4 and a super block for uh, NTFS, for example, if you have a dual boot system, right? And on mounting a file system, the OS will actually read the super block and then read the information on the super block and then perform the necessary tasks or operations to be able to use that file system uh, by the operation, to be, to be able to allow the operating system to read that particular file system, right? Uh, during the early days, uh, 
I used to have a do. Uh, I always have a dual boot system. So whenever I have a new computer, I have a Windows partition and I have a Linux partition. Now during the early days, Windows partition, uh, the Windows OS cannot actually access my Linux partition. Okay, so I think it was in Windows uh, XP. So I need to have a, a separate tool to, uh, to be able to read the Linux uh, file system. Okay? So, but in Linux, there's also the same, the same, uh, the same scenario. I cannot read the win my Windows partition. So whenever I have a file that I would like to access uh, on both Linux and uh, Windows, what I did is actually to create a data partition. And that data partition, Will just contain data and the file system for the beta, uh, data partition. I use uh, FAT FAT32 okay? because FAT32 can be used by both uh, can be read by both uh, Windows and Linux. So whenever I want to access a file both on Linux on and Windows, I place that data on that particular FAT32 file system. Okay. But uh, Windows 10 and modern versions of Windows and modern versions of Linux actually uh, evolved and they can now somehow natively uh, read both uh, AST4 or, or NTFS. Okay. So the sharing of the information is uh, straightforward nowadays. So just as, just as a side story on the evolution of file systems and the struggle that I was experiencing way back when there was no uh, native support for NTFS and EXT4 on both uh, Windows and Linux. So again, so mounting a FS OS resource for block. So I have here uh, some screenshots, screen grabs. So the command in Linux is fdisk to examine the partitions in the of the disk. So let's say here, this is my VM. So uh, this one here is checking the partitions on the ICS OS, right? So what I did here is to mount the ICS OS floppy image. And then of course we have the loopback device slash the loop one. And then I simply F this minus L to check the information of that loop device, which corresponds to the floppy disk. And you see the information here that the size of the disk is 1.42 MB, which is actually a, a floppy disk, right? And then this is the, uh, the total number of bytes for floppy disk and then the number of sectors. So these are uh, wrong information because I'm just actually accessing a floppy disk. Now this one here is the actual uh, partition okay, for my, for the VM, okay, the disk allocated for the VM, for my Linux VM. Okay, so you have, uh, so you have, I have to specify the device device name, so slash dev slash SDA. So this is the disk. And as you can see, the disk is actually divided into three partitions. So you have SDA1, SDA2, and SDA5. And they have different uh, uh, parameters. But actually the root partition, the file, the data that I access within Linux actually in the dev SDA5. So as you can see here, this is the main Linux partition. So these are just the other partitions usually with limited sectors are just uh, uh, some of the conventions okay, when, when, uh, uh, when partitioning a disk. Right? So, but the focus is actually this one, dev SDA5. Okay? Because we only have a single partition in this, uh, in this, uh, in my setup. Okay? So, yeah. So then we have inodes. Okay? So, uh, this is screenshots uh, is just illustrates that, as I mentioned, that everything in Linux or in Unix is basically treated as a file, right? And we know last time that the start command will allow us to view information about a file. So here, what I did is to perform a stat on slash dev SDA file. So remember that slash dev pertains to device files. So this one here, dev SDA file, so I'm trying to check the information about uh, this uh, partition SDA5 as shown here, which is the main Linux partition that I have. And you will see the information about this SDA5. So it has a, 
uh, an inode number 338, as you can see here, it's an inode number 338. And there is an indicator here that is a blocked special device. Right? So recall that in, in the previous meeting, we talked about files, regular files and directories. But in addition to these regular files and directories, Linux also support special device files. So as you can see, uh, dev sda5, which is actually a partition on the disk is a block device, so block special file. And you see some access permissions here. And uh, yeah, okay, so these are the device type. Now I also tried to perform a stat on dev tty. So dev tty, probably you've uh, seen this control alt F1. So it's terminal interface, basically keyboard, a teletype interface to accept input. And as you can see, it's also a special file, but this time it is a character device file. As you can see here, so character special file, and then it also has an inode number, which is 21. So you will notice that the inode number for this is quite small, right? Why? Because this, uh, the entries, these inodes were actually created early, early in the setup of the operating system, probably during setup of the operating system. So you see that the number here is 21, right? Uh, which is very small compared to, let's say, you just created a new file and then you perform a stat on the particular file and you get a very large number, right? And then and here's an example of directory. Okay, so you will notice the start temp here. So you will see that the inode number is very large, right? Because the stamp slash temp probably was created uh, late in the installation process, right? In the setup process. So this time it is a directory. It's a special device, it's a directory. There are several links to this and it has specific size, right? And you will notice that the special files don't have sizes, as you can see here. And temp here has a size of 1496. All right. So let's take a look at the inode table in this uh, FS. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this will be the layout of the partition. And this will constitute the uh, this part here, okay, zero to seven, this part here. Okay. So you have the super block. Okay, zero to four KB. Okay, so that's one one block, and then the uh, the inode bitmap four KB to eight KB. So re always remember that when we talk of KB, we always multiply by ten twenty four. Okay, it's not one thousand, but rather ten twenty four. So eight KB to twelve KB, that will be the data bitmap, and then we have the inode block. So as you can see. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, five inode blocks. Okay, so so one, two, three, four, five, zero to four, and uh, since the size of the inode is two hundred fifty-six bytes, therefore in one block we can have sixteen inodes, right? So you can have sixteen inodes, and since since we only have uh, seventy-nine inodes, then we can have only probably 80 files in this particular file, very simple file system. Because we said that an inode represents a single file, right? So if we only have this allocation for the inode block, which is uh, five blocks, then, and each inode is 256 bytes, then we can only have zero to uh, 79 inodes. So we can have 80 files, okay? So that will limit the size of the file system, right? So yeah, and uh, okay. So that's basically the idea of the inode table. So uh, let's say this one inode zero will represent the uh, a specific file. So let's say let's look at this example. Uh, to this example, let's say twenty one. Okay, so. Uh, dev TTY is inode number 21. So if we look at that, so we get, we get here, let's say this is inode number 21, right? And that will represent the slash uh, temp file, uh, slash dev TTY file, right? Now let's say, let's try to do some computation, right? So uh, let's say our task is to read inode number 32, right? So 
I know numbers that I know number 32. Okay, so this one here. Okay. So let's say that uh, you open a file. If you recall our discussion about opening a file, and you will have a file descriptor, right? And that file descriptor will have a corresponding inode number. And if you open that file, then the file system uh, file system will have to look for the inode number, right? So let's say inode number 32. What will be the steps that will be taken to, to do that? So the first one is to calculate the offset in the inode region, okay? So how do you calculate the, the offset? So the goal is to be able to read this value. You need to find this, uh, the location of this on the disk. So remember that at the partition, remember that the partition has been divided into blocks, right? So how do you do that? So you first calculate the offset in the inode region. So that will be 32, 30. So this is the inode region, right? So from 12 KB to 32 KB. That is the inode region. First, try to get the offset here. So this will be 32 times 256. So that will be, this one will be 8192, the offset on the inode region of this particular inode. Second one is to add the start address of the inode region. So the start address of the inode region is 12 KB. So 12 KB, times 1024, that will be 12288 plus the offset within the inode region, which is 8192. So that means that it will be 2480 or 20 KB. So which is exactly here, right? So this is 20 KB here, right? So remember in each block, we can have 16 right, inodes. Okay, so we have now we now have 20 KB. Now we have to convert the block to sector on disk. So remember that we call our discussion about disk, and the smallest division of uh, a disk is a sector. But right now we are talking about blocks. Blocks is a higher level of abstraction, meaning uh, it's by design. Right? So we have four four KB, which is actually 4096 bytes. Right. So what we're going to do is to uh, convert that, this particular block 20 KB, convert that to uh, the actual sector on the disk. So basically you divide that by the sector size, which is 512 and we get 40. So this means that on the disk, recall our disk layout, right? We have uh, track sectors and we have sector numbers. So when reading the disk, or say you have a hard disk, it will be 40. So there's a question here, what is this 512? 512 is the size of a sector on the disk. Uh, you get the idea? So the size of a sector on the disk, we call our discussion on, uh, on this, okay? So we have to divide that, okay? So this one is block size, all right? So yeah. So in uh, sir, sorry, uh, sorry, hindi ko na kat saan po galing yung one two eight eight. So this is where did this one two two eight eight came from? This will be uh, we have. So it says here that we have to add the start address of the inode region. So the start address of the inode region is twelve KB, right? Twelve and twelve times ten twenty four, right? Uh, 10, uh, 12 times 10, 10, 24, that will give you 1288. Yeah, okay, great. So yeah, 12 times 10, 1288, and then you have to add this A192, okay, and then you get this, which is actually 20 KB, which is shown here. So yeah, and then we have to divide that by 512 and you get 40. That will be the actual sector on the disk okay, that, you are going to perform uh, to do some rotational latency and uh, seek time to be able to do that. Now, it depends on the on the disk parameters, but typically, as I mentioned in our previous uh, discussion about disk, the manufacturer can guarantee 
an atomic write of 512 bytes only. So most of the time, that the size of the sector is 512 bytes only. So in one shot, the, uh, it is the, the manufacturer, the device can guarantee that it can per perform an operation within five uh, only for 512 bytes. So normally it is always 512 bytes. So as you can see in the uh, as you can see in the F disk here. Okay, uh, you have unit sectors. Okay, so it's always 512 bytes most of the time. But there are configurations that you can increase this to 1024 if, let's say, you have a high end for a data, for a data center, for example. Okay, uh, Seagate can create a, a can create a hard drive that can write or can guarantee 1024 bytes. Okay, yeah, those are good questions, right? Great. So in case of the formula, you have the formula, this is how it can be done. All right. Yeah. Now uh, I have an aside here. This one is not included in the textbook. This is the Linux command or the, the Linux tool that will allow you to explore or examine, debug, or uh, analyze. Uh, a Linux file system. Normally, Linux file systems are of type uh, ext3 or ext4, ext2, ext3, ext4. So I've, I've used Linux for a long time, so I've experienced using ext2, ext, ext4. But nowadays, uh, what, we're, what Linux is using is ext4. So debug fs is the tool to allow you to examine the Linux file system. So here you have uh, SDA5. So sudo debug fs and you have to specify the device right so yeah so what i did here is to so recall our boot.txt last time boot.txt so start boot.txt to uh, boot.txt and we have this output right so this is within debug fs right and then the contents here is yeah hard com say 125 right so this, these are the information contained on the inode that represents uh, boot2.txt. Right? So this is the inode number. Right? So, and you have other information here. Now, I also dump, you can also dump the, the super block. Right? I mentioned the super block earlier. So you can also do that, dump the super block from debug fs. So this is the output of is the stats command that displays the characteristics or the, the information stored in the super block. Right? So you can see like uh, where this particular partition was mounted. So it's slash here. Uh, the inode count shows here the total inode in the file system, in the partition, SDA5, uh, the reserve block, uh, block pound, the number of blocks okay, available. Okay? and then free blocks, et cetera. So you can explore this on your own files, on your own VM. You can try this on your own VM to examine the information about the a super block here, okay? But I, well, I would like you to be careful because you, can, you might uh, destroy your system if you recklessly try this uh, debug FS. Since especially your uh, files, uh, your partition is actually mounted, okay? So most of the time, if you want to fix errors, on your file system, you have to unmount that file system and perform the operation on the device without being mounted. Okay, so that changes will not happen randomly in your file system. So that's just a word of warning. I've had a lot of this uh, got busted, especially if the super block is destroyed, right? If the super block is destroyed, then there, there no information can be retrieved from your, uh, from your partition. Okay, so be careful with doing, manipulating uh, file systems like that using debug FS. Okay, so what else? So what I did here is from debug FS, what I did is to dump. So this is the inode number, okay? So this is the inode number. So I'm just experimenting with using debug FS to dump the, uh, the data using uh, uh, the inode number. So this is the inode number, 239. And as you can see here, when I use the command dump, 239, and then this will be the output file. And then I output the contents after being dumped. So it's the same as boot.txt. So I use the inode number here, 
And since they both refer to the same file, I got the same result. Okay. So here are some of the information about an inode. Okay. This is from the textbook. But if you want actual data, basically this is the output of the stat command, both in debug FS or the standalone uh, uh, stat tool. Okay. So you have a lot of information here. So in an inode, you have a this one, this particular field here, uh, block of uh, disk pointers. Okay? So this block of, of disk pointers actually point to the actual data, data block, okay? where the data is uh, for that particular file is are stored. Okay? So an inode contains pointers to blocks in the data region that contains the actual data. Okay? So this is the field for that. So I think this, I forgot what file system is this, but this one has a 15. So you can have up to 15 for a file, for a file, you can have up to 15 uh, data blocks. So 15 times 40, 96. So that will somehow, or 15 times 40, 96, that will somehow determine the maximum file size that your file system can have, right? So if you have uh, if you have this limited number of uh, uh, pointers to actual data blocks, okay? So that will determine the maximum uh, file size right, that you can have. Uh, okay, so we can also have multi-level multi indices, right? So uh, you can have uh, different indirection. Recall the idea of uh, paging, multi-paging. Okay, in the virtual memory lab, so similar to that. And also, instead of pointers to actual data blocks, the inode contains pointers to blocks that contain uh, other pointers. Okay, so, uh, yeah. so that's basically this one. That, that means a multi-level indices, multi-level paging, okay, if you recall that. Other file systems use extents. Okay? So instead of using direct pointers, you have extents, meaning uh, extent would mean a pointer plus the length. Okay, so as you can see here, this is for the uh, for this one. Okay, so this is ext4. Okay, in my in my VM ext4. So it uses extents. So this is the extent being used. And if you look at the information, you can see that this is the extent. All right, so we have some uh, observations uh, about file systems. Most files are small. Average file size is growing. Most bytes are stored in large files. Uh, most file systems contain uh, lots of files. File systems are roughly half full and directories are typically small, okay? But many have few entries, most have 20 or fewer. So uh, based on experience, you can probably attest that these are a true. Okay, uh, regarding the directory organization, so, so we recall that we have a file and we have, for each file we have an inode and the directory is nothing more than a mapping between a file name and the inode. So here you have, I have an example, what's this? Uh, I think this is an inode for temp, this temp folder, okay? So I have this uh, information for the uh, temp folder, okay? And uh, this one here is from the book. So basically just a record that describes a directory. So you have the inode number and then the name. So this, the, those are the basic information for a, for a directory, the name of the file and the inode number, right? So that you can look, look for, for this particular file. And then you have the record length and the string length, right? So you can have a pretty long uh, file name here. So what I did here in this illustration is, again, I opened the uh, SDA5 and then uh, temp. Okay, so I have a temp folder here. This is a folder, this is a directory. So if I dump that, okay, I get uh, using this inode, uh, uh, this one, using this inode uh, number. So this is a directory 194. So when I dump that, so I get a debug FS for the temp folder. And then uh, this is the binary, uh, this is the binary file of this temp debug FS, which was dumped. This is basically the content. So uh, when you dump a directory, 
inode, you get this binary file. Basically, uh, as a, a more complex version of this record. Right? But you can see that this directory, this is the actually the folder in this directory, the temp folder. These are the files. Uh, this one is a directory. This one is a file, and this one is a directory. And you can see uh, this is a, a, a the temp debug fs here is a binary file. So you can use od to hex dump that. And you can see the file name install Monaco font, which is this file. And then you can also see the uh, the folder CD8L, Lab01, Neil Sarias. Right? Are you here? Okay. And then so, yeah. and then we have uh, the sample folder. Okay. So just to illustrate the contents of the directory, when you dump the directory, the, the inode for a directory, right? the data okay, for a particular inode. So here you have to, uh, his the inode number 283. Uh, 3661. So you can see here what this one is the uh, uh, what I did here is to dump or to start yung uh, to start sample. Okay? So what I did to start sample, and you can see that this one here is actually the hex uh, the hex of this value. So this uh, this inode number for sample is this one. So this is some this is sample this is the inode number for that. So these are the contents of the directory. Well, description and link uh, and link deletes a file name from the file uh, from the file system if that name was the last link to a file and the process had the file open then the file is deleted and the space request using is made available for use so uh, this particular uh, system call this is actually used in rm is the one responsible for deleting a file so is it possible to recover deleted files okay so essentially uh, if unlink just uh, removes files on the directory entry, then probably the inode for the actual file will still remain, right? So you can actually recover deleted files as long as they have not, the data blocks for that particular file have not been uh, overwritten. You get the idea. So uh, let's say, let's go back to our diagram to recovering deleted files. So, Let's say this is our uh, layout. So you have an inode here, inode for a file. You deleted the inode information, but the data, okay, the data for from that that is being referenced or that that are being pointed to by that inode have not been cleared. Okay? So you can you can actually recover the data, right? So that's essentially the idea. So you just deleted the inode, probably reuse the inode later. Okay? but the actual data have not been uh, cleared yet, then you can actually recover a uh, deleted file. So probably you've used uh, tools before that will allow you to recover uh, deleted files. Let's say you accidentally deleted your photos, for example, on a flash drive. Okay? So there are tools to be able to do that depending on the file system. But right now what we're talking about is a typical ext 2 ac 3 file system. Okay, so yeah. Next one is free space management. So how do you manage free space? So if you have uh, a disk and of course, say you have uh, 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 lots of files, so or how does how does the file system manage uh, uh, when uh, where to get okay, where to get data blocks or inode number? But as you can see earlier, we only have uh, in the VSFS we have eighty inodes. So you can have a maximum of eighty. Uh, 80 files. So yeah. So uh, so usually you scan. Uh, uh, you can use okay. You use a a free list or a bitmap. So most uh, as in the implementation of VSFS, we have a bitmap for that okay? to represent uh, the available uh, inode block and data block. Right. So, so we now move on to the second uh, ways, way to look at file system, which is access path. How this part, how this particular file system access data. So let's have an example here, reading a file. Let's say this is the file name that you would like to read, slash foobar. The size of this file is 12 KB. So if we have 12 KB and our block is of size 4 KB, then we have, we'll have three blocks for this read. So what are the steps 
taken to be able to read this file. So you have a uh, first open okay, bar. So uh, what will happen is to go to the root inode. So assuming that uh, there is a root inode already, okay? meaning it is a well-known uh, inode number. It uses a default uh, uh, node inode number. So you read that and then uh, since this is a directory, it will contain an inode, a pointer to an inode uh, foo. So you read that and then finally, uh, re, uh, no, uh, you have to read first the inode. Okay, so this, this block here is for the, for the inode region. Okay. So again, we have, that, we have the, the three parts here. So this is the bitmap, okay? Bitmap, this is the inode, and you have the data. Okay. So these are the steps being taken by uh, when you're reading a file. So you start with uh, uh, the inode, okay? Then you read the data, and then you get, you, when you read the data, you get the information that it, it points to foo, which is a folder. Then you read the data again for foo data and then do the actual read. And then once you've opened that particular file, you have now access to the inode for uh, bar. Then you perform a read on the inode. Uh, you need to read the inode bar. Uh, you need to read the bar inode because you want to know the pointer to the data block. So once you know that, you go to read that bar data, which is first block, and then second block, and then the third block. So these are the operations necessary to be able to read that particular file, okay, given these parameters. All right. So as I mentioned, how does the file system know what is the inode number of root? Okay, usually, the number is two, the default. Right? The default inode number for the root is two. So during the installation, the setup, this particular uh, uh, folder or directory, which the root of the file system slash is given an inode number two, okay? So that's why it, it can automatically uh, be used by the file system. Now for writing a file, uh, it's almost the same. Again, you have the uh, the bitmap block, you have the inode block, and then you have the data block. So if you want to create a file, first you need to go to the, so let's say you want this, this file does not exist and you want to create that. So first you have to go again to the root inode, read the data, full inode, read the data, and then you go to the inode bitmap. Uh, you, you have to, read the inode bitmap because you're creating a file. When you create a file, you need to create an inode. So go to the inode bitmap, look for an available uh, inode that you can use. And then you perform the write on the inode bitmap once you have determined what inode number is that. And then you go to the data, okay? So you go to the full data, right? And then you update the information that you're creating a file within this folder. And then uh, you read, the bar inode and then write, et cetera. And then you get to write the three blocks for that particular file, okay? So that is the idea of, right? So you see a lot of IO happening here, okay? So really writing files is expensive, okay? So the way to, uh, to improve that is by using caching or buffering. So you can have fixed size caches, okay? So pre-allocated so that you don't have to read the uh, always from the disk, or you can be dynamic, meaning it's integrated to the virtual memory. When we talk about demand paging, okay, that's why we have the same size for the, for the page and the block. Okay? So caching reduces IO for reads, okay? and buffering basically delayed writes, and batching reduces IO for writes. So when doing this, you can, can actually, so that means that even though you are, there is an operation to write to the disk, you don't immediately act on that. So you pull a lot of write requests and then perform the write by batch, rebatches. Okay? So uh, you only have to perform the seek and uh, rotation uh, once okay? in one shot. Okay? So interrupts will not happen regularly. 
And an example of this will be temporary files. So you, if your program creates temporary files, and normally those temporary files will be created and delayed, deleted, right? Uh, bef uh, after the, the, the execution of the process. So there's actually no need to write these temporary files to the disk, right? Because they will be eventually be deleted by the, uh, by the processes, right? So, yeah. So that's it. Uh, do you have questions? At this point, and if not, then I can have the, we can have the quiz. Uh, are there other questions that uh, you'd like to uh, to be uh, uh, to answer? Okay, if none, portion uh, par, uh, portion po ba yung kanina po? What do you mean? Uh, what do you mean portion? 